Okay guys, functionalism. Um, this is just going to be a little bit of a quick introduction to functionalism, its epistemic foundations, um, its influences and some of the main issues that were involved in it. Um, if you've seen some of my other videos before you know that I quite like functionalism so um, um, this this will be the perspective that I'll be primarily focusing on. Okay, so functionalism is monist, that is, it suggests that the universe is only constituted from one type of thing. Now, um, as I've shown you before, dualism, unless you can come up with a way to rectify the problems that Descartes faced, you're not really going to get anywhere with it. Um, so, um, Descartes obviously put the world into the material and the spiritual, and, you know, there's a conflict going on there. So, if, if we accept materialism, um, implicitly in the language, we renounce the spiritual. We say that um, there's, you know, stuff, and that's all there is. There's no mind things, that's just epiphenomena, so to speak. Um, I think functionalism takes a slightly different perspective, um, because the, the word material was actually sort of, and materialism was designed around this Cartesian split, you know, so it's it's rather unhelpful in that way. Um, functionalism suggests that conscious states um, can be realized and can, and, and the only way to explain them is by causal relationships um, with symbolic entities within a system. Um, that is, the certain, the certain, the material um, the stuff arranges itself into certain states and um, it's the causal relationships between these states and it's the processing um, itself that gives rise to consciousness. Um, that is, it's a monist perspective as I mentioned before, there's only one type of stuff in the universe. Okay, so um, I think it was Putman who first suggested something uh, like functionalism. And one of the things that he was talking about primarily was, um, well, materialism tended to be especially ty uh, identity materialism, um, which it was quite elitist because they, they realized in order for you to have the exact same experience, subjective experience of pain or pain at all, you must have exactly the same neurological structure. And um, Putman was the first to say, well, hold on, how about animals that have different neurological structures? They're, they experience pain from what we can gather. We would think it, it would be pain. Therefore, um, how, how are we to deny these people? Uh, people that have obviously autistic savants have a completely different um, mind, mind map. So um, Putman um, suggested multiple realizability. All conscious states would have the potential to be realized through other physical mediums, be they silicon, be they alien, animal, whatever. Okay, so um, mentioned this a little bit before as well. Turing, functionalist, through and through. He came up with an objective test, and this is the this is the thing, so-called objective test. He came up with um, some way to measure objectively whether something had conscious experience or not. Of course. Personally, I would say any of these measurements that we make are mere reflections of social um, attitudes towards what the nature of consciousness is at that specific time. So I, I don't think we're going to get anywhere that way, but it's it's always good to draw our limits somewhere. Um, yeah, so so Turing suggested that a machine might one day be able to, you know, think and, and talk and things like that. and. And this was fueled quite a lot by the early optimism of AI, which didn't deliver what it promised as fast as it had promised it would. Um, but anyway, that continued. Um, a few people started to get a bit angsty at suggesting we're nothing but machines, or you know, just just mathematical state relationships between mechanical systems. Um, Ned Block was the first to, well, not the first, but he was he was one of the dudes. He basically said, a little bit like the Chinese room, which I'll go into in a bit, but he said, if you arranged all of China um, passing boxes um, to each other, which were identical to the, the information being passed between synapses, 
then technically it should be conscious. Isn't that just completely absurd? Doesn't that just make you want to dismiss uh, functionalism? But obviously the functionalist answer would be, well, no, you know, if it, acts, if it acts that way, if it's carrying out the exact same function, it is conscious. It is. Um, Chinese room, um, I'm going to dedicate a whole video to that because I believe it's quite an important uh, uh, challenge to functionalism. I think it's, um, well, I, I, I think it has been misrepresented by us functionalists, but I've read um, quite a lot of, of Searle and I've listened to quite a lot of his podcasts and I know what he's trying to get at, so we'll we'll challenge that a little bit later it's essentially a bit like the chinese room uh, uh, chinese brain um other challenges to functionalism of course um as you saw in one of the other videos the quantum challenge to functionalism so uh, it has it it has its place um i might go into that a little bit later but functionalism itself um one of the main things that i'm going to be talking about and discussing is not just that we're you know, mathematical symbols and relationships and blah 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 but um, more specifically a, a more top-down version of uh, functional, uh, bottom-up version of functionalism like Dennett or like Minsky um, I, I'll probably take on uh, Minsky's Society of Mind and Dennett's Multiple Draft Model because I think that they're, they're the shit really they're, they're good competing theories of uh, functionalism um, before we continue, before we conclude, um, Fodor, Jeremy Fodor, he was a functionalist. Um, he was a good functionalist as well, as well as a, a very good uh, neurologist. Um, but what he basically said was, he, he imagined we had this modular brain, right? So, and this is still used, this is still in place. Your brain's like got little compartments, like a compartment for memory, a compartment for uh, logical thinking, uh, creativity, etc. So you've got all these different compartments of your brain and what he suggested was that um, in order for there to be a communication between them there must be some language of thought right um, makes sense but right the language of thought this common language who's who's going to understand it like because if, if the language of thought gets passed along um, different regions of the brain I mean it's it's it could happen it's technically logically possible but it does lead to an infinite regress uh, most of the time uh, so we've got this language of thought which is telling the other parts of the brain what to do now that would mean that in each specific module of the brain um, there had to be a, a language of thought interpreter to um, interpret what the language of thought was and what it was actually doing. So this view is sort of a little bit rejected now, um, even by Fodor himself, who is a great man, by the way. Um, but basically, as I, as I mentioned in a few other videos, it's especially um, the video to do with emergence. Very important concept. Um, I mean, Searle obviously does not understand the concept of emergence if, if you've looked into his Chinese um, Chinese room. Anyway, um, this has just been a brief introduction of course. I will go into more detail in some of the points, perhaps depending on the way the comments turn out. And um, yeah, I hope you've enjoyed it. Peace.